In this video, I'm gonna walk you through a DIY solar setup. I'm gonna show you the entire process of setting up a 12 volt system with a 2000 watt inverter and a 12 volt fuse block. It's a pretty common and popular setup. What I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna break it into two parts. I'm gonna go into the classroom where I'll explain the reasoning behind everything. And then we're gonna go into the lab where we're gonna implement everything that we learn. Now, after watching this video, you will be able to easily build your own setup by either following what I outline, or you can make changes specific to your setup based on what I teach. Be sure to stick around until the end, as after we cover everything, I'm gonna explain how to easily build a diagram using the principles that we outline so that you can customize your own setup. Shown here on the screen are the two sections for this video. We're gonna talk about the classroom and the lab, and I'm gonna put the timestamps where it begins so that you can move around if you wanna come back and review any part of the video. Also below in the description section, I'm gonna put the times in the video on various subjects you may wanna go back and watch. Things like we'll go over fuses, inverter, charge controller, etc. Plus, I'm gonna put links to all the items that we covered. So the parts and the tools, everything that I'm gonna go over, you can pick those up later by going through the links below. There's a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. Classroom. Why do I recommend starting here in the classroom? I wanted to go over the concepts of each part of this setup. I've watched enough videos online showing how to piece everything together, which we're gonna do in a moment when we get into the lab. But more importantly is trying to understand what each part does and what the considerations that you have to really make before you buy these various components. So let's start with a very quick overview of this setup. This is a 12 volt, 2000 watt setup. Again, it's very popular as it can output about the same amount of power that you'd get from your home wall socket when you plug in a device. So how does this all work together? Now I'll be using a few technical terms in this explanation, but just follow along and you'll get a general idea as I explain it. In a nutshell, you have solar panels which collect energy from the sun and then they send the energy to a charge controller. Now the charge controller regulates this energy and sends it to batteries. Our batteries then store this energy. When we need to access the energy from the batteries, we simply turn on the inverter, which converts the energy stored in the batteries into usable power for our devices that we plug in here on the side, like our phones, maybe a laptop, a refrigerator, or even power tools. So let's take a quick moment to review a simple formula. I promise I'm not gonna get technical, but I do need to bring this formula up because it will determine the wiring and the fuses that we're gonna to use to connect these primary components together. Now, after I go through this formula, I'm gonna give you a simple example to help reinforce this. The formula is W divided by V equals A. Now, we know our inverter is 2000 watts, and we know that for this setup, we're gonna be powering as much as 2000 watts. 2000 is the first value for the W in our equation. Next, our inverter, our battery, and our 12 volt fuse block we're using are all rated for 12 volts. So for the V in our equation, we have 12. Now that we know the values for W and V, let's find our third value in our equation, A. Getting back to our formula, if we divide 2000 by 12, we get 166.67. So, a equals 166.67. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, a lot actually. In order to connect our inverter to the battery, that value of A, or amps, will determine the size of our wiring, the fuses, and our switches that we're gonna need in this whole setup. If you understand what I just explained, you're doing fine. Now before we go forward, let me give you a quick example to put this into terms that maybe you're more comfortable with. If you live in somewhere like a house, an apartment, an RV, or wherever you may have power, you will have a fuse box. If you've ever tripped a circuit, maybe while running a toaster, a hairdryer, or a microwave at the same time, you've had to go to the circuit breaker and reset the fuse. If we look at the fuses for our wall plugins, at least this is the case in most American homes, you're gonna see 15 on them. This fuse is rated for 15 amps. So, if we use the formula again, the A in our equation, amps, equals 15. The next variable in our equation is V, which is voltage. Now, the voltage in American homes is 120 volts. So, if a power line in our house runs 120 volts at 15 amps, that means we can determine the maximum wattage a wall socket can output. So, to find W, or watts, in this formula, we would simply multiply 120 by 15, and that would give us 1800. 
So the typical American wall socket can output 1800 watts. And this is why a 2000 watt system like what we have here in front of us is very popular. The output on the inverter is very similar to a typical home wall socket. If what I just explained to you is confusing, I'd recommend you go back and watch it a few times as the rest of this video is really gonna build off these principles that we just laid out. Here's what we're gonna do next. Before we start connecting everything up, let's explain the components that we're gonna need and how to properly size them. Here's what we're gonna cover. We're gonna go over wiring, cable lugs, fuses, switches, shunts, and bus bars. Wiring. Wiring allows us to connect the components together in our system. Wiring comes in different sizes, but how do we determine the correct size to use to connect all of the components in our system together? Let's start this discussion with connecting our inverter to the batteries. And we're gonna to need to return to our equation, W divided by V equals A. We determined that to power our inverter, we're gonna need wiring that can support 166 amps. Now, there's only one thing I need to mention here before we move on, inverter inefficiency. No inverter is 100% efficient. Typically, they're around about 85 to 90% efficiency. So what difference does this make for our setup? Remember earlier, we used the equation W divided by V equals A to get our amperage we need to run through the wiring. Well, due to inefficiency to power the inverter from the batteries, we need to factor this into our equation, which now becomes 2000 divided by 12 divided by 0.85, which now gives us a value of 196. So, Technically, we're going to be pushing 196 amps of current through our wiring if we run our inverter at full capacity. How do you find information for the wiring size based on the current that we need to send through it? There's a chart that's often referenced, and I'll put a link to it in the description section, which gives us that information. Since we need to run 196 amps through our wire, if you look at the chart, you see we're between 150 and 200 amps. When you're between numbers on a chart like this, then you need to round up to a higher number. Why? Well, because if you use a wire that's not capable of handling the current that you're gonna be pushing through it, you can burn it up and start a fire. So you always wanna go with the next size up if you're in between numbers. From the chart, we see that we need a two watt gauge to support 196 amps. Also, pay attention to the distance. In the chart, it shows you the size of the wiring based on how long your wiring will be. As distance increases, the wiring will start increasing in size. Since our run from the battery to the inverter is under three meters, two watt gauge is perfect. So now we know the size of the cable that we're gonna to need to connect the inverter to the battery. You'll use this exact principle later when you size the cables that connect the solar panels to the charge controller, the charge controller and the 12 volt fuse block to the system to the bus bar. It just really comes down to understanding how much of the components draw in amps and then based on the chart we just showed you, you can find wiring that can support that amperage. Cable lugs. At the end of our wires, we need to add cable lugs to connect to the posts of things like our inverter, our 12 volt DC fuse block, our battery, our bus bars and switches. There are a few things that you'll need to pay attention to. The first is the wire gauge size you can put this on. Remember in our previous point that we discussed the size of the wiring that we're gonna be using. Once we start building this setup, we're gonna see that we'll need different wire sizes for different devices in our system. Next, we need to pay attention to the size of the inner diameter of the screw or post that we're gonna be connecting this lug to. Some of the posts that we'll mount our wires to are large, some are gonna be small. And when purchasing each one of these products online that you'll be connecting these lugs to, they'll have information about the size so it will help you decide what cable lug size to buy. How many will you need and what sizes? We're gonna discuss all that momentarily. Fuses. Next up is fuses. Fuses help protect our wiring. The inverter and the charge controller, they already have fuses built in to protect them, so they're good. But the fuses we select will need to match the maximum amperage that a wire can carry. Remember in the previous discussion about wiring when we determined the size based on the chart, if a wire can only handle 100 amps, and that's all it's rated for, then we need to place a 100 amp fuse at the beginning of the wiring before a current is sent down it to prevent the wire from even carrying too many amps. In our setup, we're gonna be sending current from our batteries, we're gonna be sending it from solar panels, a charge controller, and a bus bar. Therefore, we're gonna place fuses at each of these devices and then connect the fuse to the wiring that goes to other components.
I know this may sound a bit conceptual at this point, but once I build this setup, you're going to see where I place the fuses. Switches. Switches allow us to easily disconnect the system from incoming energy sources. In our setup, we have solar panels sending energy to our charge controller, and we have batteries sending energy to the entire setup. By placing switches in between the solar panels and the charge controller, we can safely disconnect the panels and the batteries from the setup when we need to make changes or we just want to turn the system off. Now, During the build, we'll explain the switches you'll need and where to place them. Bus bars. Bus bars are metallic strips that allow for the distribution of incoming current. As you can see here in our setup, we've got a bus bar where our positive connections all tie into. By doing this, we can tie in to other devices we may want to power here on this bar. And you can see that there are posts with bolts along with small screws that you can easily secure wiring to. We've got our positive bus bar connected to our batteries, our inverter, our charge controller, and our 12 volt fuse block. Also, as you can see here, we've got a bus bar for our negative connections. I purchased a red and black bus bar so it's clear where to connect the positive and negative wiring to. Shunts. The last component I'll mention here is a shunt. Shown here, this shunt is connected to our system and is connected to a battery monitor. These are optional and just help us monitor the status of our batteries. Layout. For this entire setup, I'm using a piece of plywood to lay this all out in a way that you can easily follow along. Your setup will likely be very different whether you're setting this up in a bus, an RV, a van, a boat, a shed, or whatever. But again, I'll detail all the reasons and give you the necessary information so you can modify things as you need to. Typically at this point, you would want to diagram this out on paper before you start. But I want to show you the entire setup and then cover the diagram at the end. Why? Well, after you see how this whole setup is laid out, I think it will give you a much more clear understanding before you create your own diagram, which we'll cover momentarily. Lab. Inverter to batteries. All right, it's time to start connecting things up. Let's start by connecting the inverter to the batteries. And I'm purposefully going to go through quickly so you can see the big picture first. After doing this, I'll then circle back and explain how and why I performed each step. I want you to see the whole picture before we get bogged down into the details. Also, I set up the connection from the inverter to the batteries first as the cables we're using are thick and they don't really bend much at all. As such, I wanted to get this first component in place. All right. We're going to connect the positive terminal on the inverter to a fuse. We're going to connect the fuse to the positive bus bar. We're going to connect the positive bus bar to a switch. And then we're going to connect the switch to a wire, which will later connect to the positive terminal of the battery. Then we're going to connect the negative terminal of the inverter to a negative bus bar. Connect the bus bar to a shunt and then connect the shunt to a wire, which will later connect to the negative terminal of the battery. I know I covered a lot very quickly, but let's swing back and explain everything in detail. Let's start with the inverter. There are some holes on the side which we'll use to mount this down to the plywood. We can easily access the AC ports here at the top to plug in our appliances. Now in order to connect our inverter to the fuse, we're going to need to cut some wiring and add cable lugs on the end of the wire. Remember earlier when we discussed the amount of current that this inverter will require? Based on a formula, we determined that we need wiring that can handle 196 amps. The wire that we have here is 2 aught gauge and can handle 200 amps. As shown here, I put the cable lugs on the post of the components we're going to connect together. This serves two purposes. First, I can make sure I'm getting the correct cable lug as some have different sizes based on what you're connecting to. And secondly, I can then measure the distance of the cable based on where these cable lugs are located. Due to the thickness of this particular cable, I had to use a bolt cutter to cut the wire. Now, once I cut the wire, I had to strip off the insulation off both ends of the cable. I used this cutting tool and was very careful to gently make cuts to get through the insulation and not impact the metal inside the wiring. I had to then add the cable lugs on the end. As shown, I had to use a special tool to hammer the cable lugs of the wire. There are tools that are smaller to connect the lugs to cables. We're going to cover those shortly, but due to the thickness of this particular wire, I had to use this particular device, which requires you to hammer it down. Also remember, when putting these cable lugs on, please keep them at the same orientation. What do I mean? If we add one cable lug on one end, and then we started the process to add the second lug on the other end, if the second cable lug was at a 90 degree angle to the first, 
I wouldn't be able to mount these on our inverter and fuse. So, as shown here, they're at the same angle relative to each other. Next, we need to add shrink wrap to the wire so that we're insulating and protecting the area where cable lugs and wiring connect. These kits you order online will typically come with these. You can use either a cigarette lighter to apply heat to these, or as shown here, use a heat gun. But be careful as these will get very hot. One other pro tip. When I purchased the 2 aught gauge wiring at Home Depot, they had only black cable. For this part of the video, we're connecting the positive terminal of the inverter to the positive terminal of the battery. So, I went back and I wrapped the black cables with red tape. Ideally, you want to purchase red cables, but we improvised here. Additionally, when adding the shrink wrap to the cables, put red shrink wrap on the positive cables and black shrink wrap on the negative cables. As shown here, I will connect our cable to a 200 amp fuse, which is held in a fuse holder, which you can secure down with screws. I put this fuse between the inverter and the bus bar. Next, I connect my custom wire from the fuse to our positive bus bar. The positive bus bar is where we'll also connect our charge controller and 12 volt fuse block momentarily. Think of this as a hub where we'll connect different devices that send or receive current. From the bus bar, I'll repeat the process of sizing and customizing our cable, then connect it to the switch. Our system will have two switches, but for this particular one, I need the ability to send a lot of amperage through this particular switch. This particular switch is rated for 275 amps, which is more than enough for the 200 amp maximum current that we're gonna pull from the battery. As you can see here, the switch has two studs, which will bolt our wires onto. When working on the system, all I have to do is disconnect the batteries via the switch. Lastly, I'll add the cable that goes from our switch to the batteries. Again, I'm not gonna connect the batteries yet, but rather I'll just connect the wiring, which will then connect to the battery later. All right, now that we have all the wiring connected to each component, I'm gonna secure these components to the board. I waited until I finished connecting everything as these cables are so thick that you really can't bend them. I had mounted a few of the components earlier before cutting off the cables and I found that if the connections on the end of the cables are even something as short as a quarter of an inch off, I have to then move the bus bar or fuse holder to get everything to connect properly. So let's run through the negative connection from the inverter to the battery. Repeating the same process, I create custom wires with cable lugs that connect each component together. Since this wire is already black, I don't have to add tape as I did with the red tape on the wire running down the positive side. I then connected it from the negative terminal of the inverter to the negative bus bar. As described earlier in the video, the bus bar is a central juncture where we can tie into other wires in one place. Are bus bars required in this project like this? Not necessarily as you could tie everything together in one connection for the negative wires, but it does make managing things a lot easier. From the negative bus bar, I created another custom wire for our shunt. As we detailed earlier, the shunt allows us to connect a battery monitor so we can see the status of the battery. Is it required? Not really, but it's a nice item to have to see in real time what the battery status is. Now on the other end of the shunt, we're gonna connect our cable that will later connect to the negative terminal of our batteries. In order to connect the shunt to the battery monitor, it comes with a small cord that runs down to the positive terminal of our first battery that we have connected in parallel. Now, I know we covered a lot in this segment, but the rest of the video utilizes these principles we just laid out. Let's move into connecting solar via the charge controller. Solar charge controller. For our setup, we're using a charge controller that can handle a maximum of 520 watts on a 12 volt system like ours. I've got four 100 watt monocrystalline solar panels in series. In the manual for this charge controller, they recommend a fuse between the solar panels and the charge controller. To determine the fuse size, since we're connecting the solar panels in series, the amperage will not increase, but the voltage will. Now, it gets a bit beyond the scope of this video to detail the series versus parallel solar panel setup, but a quick search on Google will explain this in more detail if you wanna do a deeper dive. Since we're only using four small panels, a series connection made the most sense for me. For these panels, their short circuit current rating, or ISC, is 5.21 amps. So. To determine the fuse size to put on the positive wire coming from the solar panels connected in series, I multiply 5.21 by a factor of 1.56, which gives us 
Now, getting into a lengthy discussion of where we get 1.56 is again beyond the scope of this video, but it's a value that in this industry is standard to determine the fuse size to connect to the solar panels. Again, with our calculated value of 8.13, we need to find a fuse this size or larger. Looking online, I found an inline MC4 fuse, which is rated for 10 amps, shown here. Now, before we connect our solar panels to our charge controller, I want to install a disconnect switch that allows us to easily disconnect our solar from our system. We need a circuit breaker specifically designed for DC, which is what comes from our solar panels and is rated for high voltage. I found the circuit breaker, which did the trick. Adding in our positive and negative wires to the top, I then ran the positive and negative wires to our charge controller from the switch. Again, our charge controller handles the energy coming from the panels, which it then sends to the batteries. I mounted the charge controller at the top of the board next to our inverter. With the wires coming from our circuit breaker, I plugged the red or positive wire into the PV plus port on the charge controller and the negative wire or black wire into the PV negative port on the charge controller. Next, we're gonna run the positive and negative wire from our charge controller to the positive and negative bus bars. To do this on the charge controller, there are two ports at the bottom. BAT minus and BAT plus that we'll put our wires into. But what size wiring and fuse should we add in here? Since this is a 40 amp charge controller, our wiring coming from the charge controller will need to be able to handle a maximum of 40 amps. According to our chart, 40 amps requires eight gauge wiring. Again, I picked this up at Home Depot purchasing red and black eight gauge wiring. Additionally, the manual for the charge controller recommends a 40 amp fuse coming from the charge controller. Remember in our discussion earlier about fuses, we want to put these as close to the power source to protect our wiring. I therefore installed a 40 amp fuse close to the charge controller. Earlier in the video, I went into detail explaining how to cut the cables, cut off the insulation on the ends, and then add cable lugs on the large 2 watt cable. The tools needed for smaller cables are different. To begin with, we'll determine the distance from the charge controller to the 40 amp fuse. Measuring that distance, we'll then cut our wire with the tool shown here. To strip the insulation off the ends of this eight gauge or smaller wire, there's a tool that you can use as shown here. It cuts the insulation perfectly and you can then strip the insulation off the end. On one end of the wire, we're not gonna need a cable lug as we'll plug this directly into the charge controller. And then on the other end, we're gonna put on a cable lug. Since these cables aren't as large as a two watt gauge wire, there's a tool to crimp the cable lug onto the end of the cable. Again, find the right cable lug based on the wire size and the size of the post that you're gonna be connecting to before attaching it to the cable. We're gonna repeat this process going from the fuse to the positive bus bar, measuring the length of the cable we'll need, cutting the wiring, stripping the insulation, putting on the cable lug, and then finally adding the shrink wrap. Additionally, from the charge controller, we're gonna to need to run another cable to the negative bus bar. It will be the same size as the cable we ran to the positive bus bar, but this one will be black. Additionally, we can connect a Bluetooth module to the charge controller, which will allow us to monitor it via an app. 12 volt fuse block. The last major component that we're gonna add is a 12 volt fuse block. This allows us to run 12 volt devices. This one I purchased can handle 125 amps maximum coming in. Now, if we go back to our chart, we'll see we need a one gauge wire to handle 125 amps. Now, I don't plan on using more than a few devices all connect, so I purposefully went small on the cable that's coming in to connect the fuse block to our system. I went with a four gauge wire, which is only rated at 100 amps. Remember, this is a custom setup particular to my needs. My plans are to only plug in maybe one or two 12 volt devices, which will be less than one amp. So, I purposefully went small on the cable and connecting the fuse block to the rest of the system. Plus I put in a five amp fuse shown here in the block that connects a 12 volt device. But if you do plan on using your fuse block for a heavier load, then of course connect this to the bus bars with a one gauge wire as recommended if you wanna push the maximum load through this. Additionally, it is recommended that you put a fuse between the positive bus bar and the fuse block as we've done with the inverter and the charge controller. But since I'm barely gonna be using this device, I just skipped the fuse entirely. And that was my decision for my setup but please configure your setup as recommended based on what you're gonna be powering. Again, as we did with the other components in the system, I measure the distance from the fuse block to the positive and negative bus bars and then customize the cables and cable lugs accordingly. 
You'll want to pay attention to the cable logs on the end of the wires as there'll be different sizes on both ends as the post on the bus bars is much bigger than the post on the fuse block. These wires are still malleable enough to bend into place. Batteries. I use 12 volt, 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate self-heating batteries that can be connected in parallel. Before connecting them, test the voltage to make sure they're close. They both register the same voltage, so we can now connect them. If they don't match, charge them one at a time to max capacity or discharge them completely and then you'll be ready to connect them. I purchased these cables that allow me to connect them in parallel as shown here. For this particular manufacturer, you can only connect up to a total of four in parallel. When you first get these batteries, they're in shelf mode. To activate them, simply use the tool they sent by plugging it in then holding down the button until it turns a bright blue. This will activate them both as they're connected together. Additionally, you can connect these together with a Cat5 cable to monitor their status. You can monitor their status by connecting a module that either allows you to directly connect to your phone via Bluetooth to their app, or we can monitor them with a battery monitor that we installed earlier when connecting to the shunt. To connect the batteries to our system, I first make sure the switch we installed is in the off position. Since we have two batteries in parallel, I'll connect the positive cable coming from our system to the positive terminal on the first battery and the negative cable on the negative terminal on the second battery. Also note that I've placed the 200 amp fuse on the positive terminal that our cable going to the system is connected to. Since our system is a 200 amp setup, that's the max current that we can ever pull from these batteries and our wires are rated to only handle 200 amps. So it's important that we put our fuse right here at the point of origin for our power to protect all of the cables. Earlier we mentioned installing a shunt. As you can see here, the shunt is connected to our battery via the small cord and we can then see the status of the battery. Cord organization. When we've got everything laid out, you can use clips like this to secure down the wires to make sure everything stays neatly in place. But since most of our wires are fairly stiff, I didn't really need many, but they were useful in a few places. Grounding. Next, we need to ground our inverter and charge controller. If you look at the side of both of these, they have a grounding connection that we can connect to. Depending on where you put this setup, for example, if you're in a vehicle, you wanna connect the grounding cable to the chassis. I'm gonna be putting my setup in a shed in my backyard and I have a grounding rod that I can connect to there. You can also connect these to the negative bus bar in your system as shown here, and then connect the negative bus bar to the grounding device. I'm using a green six gauge wire. Green is typically the color for grounding. Testing. Okay, we've built this out and I've had it connected to solar panels that charge the batteries, so let's test this out. Shown here, I'm testing the pure sine wave capabilities on the AC inverter, everything looks good. Let's connect a few simple devices and monitor the battery output as we're running them. After running them, let's take a look to see if the cables or cable lugs got warm. As shown here, they barely warmed up, so we're good. Again, with the right size wiring, we'll be fine. Also shown here with the solar panels connected, we're getting power coming into our charge controller. Diagram. So now that we see everything is working, let's take a look at building a simple diagram based on everything that we learn. Before you start building out your system, I would encourage you to start here as it will really help you to understand what you need to purchase and then how to lay everything out in your own particular setup. Let me just make a quick comment about doing a diagram. What I did is if you look, um, I just really set down and establish, okay, you know, I've got a 2001 inverter, I've got a charge controller, I've got, you know, bus bars, I've got fuses, where do I want to place them? I've got batteries. And then you can see the red represents positive and then I kept black as black. Later I went in and I added the grounding lines. You don't see those here represented. I just added those at the end. But the thought process was pretty simple. I just started out with the inverter as kind of more or less a cornerstone and I just built around it. And as you saw throughout the video, this is how my setup ended up looking. And you'll see in some places where we've kind of got, you know, a half dome look where we hop over wire. Uh, I'm by no means a electrician, but just studying different diagrams online, I saw how they use that process to help establish, you know, where lines cross each other. Uh, but again, this is, uh, you know, just really what I'm trying to show here is just the thought process. You can see I, perp and again, this is not based on any units or anything like that. I put W for wiring, F for fuses, 
and I think there was one other designation that I used. Oh yeah, amps, or rather the fuses, I put F as for fuse. And then what I did is I came over and I labeled over on the side, you know, like, okay, fuses, um, you know, then the S and uh, the Ws. You know, I just started documenting everything here on the side so that way I could see what do I need to go back. And I'm sorry, S, by the way, is switch. Um, and this was just a system I came up with. Again, use whatever makes the most sense for you. But the purpose is start with this before you really buy any the components. Go through, think it through, where you want to place everything, how you want to wire it up, fuses the switches. And I would encourage you to go online and look at, for example, even post size on these different devices because then you'll, you'll know what size cable lugs you'll need to buy. It's just really, again, about mapping this out. And I'll post links to other professional diagrams. This is just kind of my rudimentary, very uh, amateur I, I went through and kind of cleaned it up later where I just, you know, and then I had, and there were several thought processes that I had to go through. And then I even sat down and took notes, you know, as I was going along. But doing this really helped me think through the setup before I bought anything or put anything down. And again, I'll post links to other diagrams that you can go and look at that will help a lot. Hopefully this video gave you enough information to help you build your own custom setup. Now I know there was a lot that we covered, but Taking information that we use in the classroom where I went through and explained the components and the logic behind everything, and then showing how I implemented that in the lab, you know, building this all out, hopefully by taking that information and showing you, you can understand how to build your own setup. There's really no requirements that you build like I do. Again, just use the wiring chart, make sure that you have the right lug size, make sure that you're just oversizing when you're not sure but make sure that you have fuses and everything set up based on the values and the way we explain it. A lot of this is not complicated. It's just sitting down, really making sure that you're using, again, the right wire size, the right fuse size, and the right lug sizes to make sure everything ties together correctly. If you have any feedback, any thoughts, any questions, feel free to post that below. And I'll post links to the charts, the diagrams, all the parts, all the tools, everything that we talked about in the description and comment section below. As always, stay safe out there.